Welcome everybody. This is the second in a series of webinars that we're putting on uh, working together in collaboration with Leukemia Care and Lymphoma Action. Um, and today we're focusing on um, navigating the pathway for lymphoma and leukemia, supporting you to self-management. Uh, so without further ado, I will get my colleagues to introduce themselves. So welcome. Um, Prem, let me start with you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Stephen. Um, hi, my name is Prem Mahendra. I'm a consultant hematologist at University Hospital Birmingham, and I specialize in looking after patients with blood cancer and those undergoing stem cell transplantation. And Doreen? Um, yes, I'm Doreen. I was diagnosed with uh, SLL, stroke CLL, 13 years ago. And four years ago, I completed a course of FCR. Thanks, and Barbara. Hi, I'm Barbara von Barzovich. I'm one of the hematology clinical nurse specialists at the North Middlesex Hospital in London. I have a special interest in lymphomas and chronic leukemias, but cross cover the other blood cancers also. And Reem. Hello, my name is Reem and I was diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma 14 years ago and I've been clear of the disease for 14, well, almost 14 years now. Thanks. And Charlotte? Thanks, Stephen. Um, hi, I'm Charlotte. I'm patient advocacy manager at Leukemia Care and as Stephen said, we are working together on webinars that are of relevance to both the lymphoma and leukemia patients. Thanks. So Charlotte and myself will be taking it in turns to kind of share and, and lead, uh, chair and lead on different aspects of uh, today's webinar. So we're going to have a quick introduction around setting the scene about lymphoma and leukemia, and then we'll go into five kind of main sections about the diagnosis um, and uh, treatment uh, along the pathway as well. So Prem, if you could help us to set the scene around giving an introduction to lymphoma and leukemia, differences, similarities. Thank you very much. Um, leukemias and lymphomas come under the broad umbrella of blood cancers and simply leukemia can be described as a liquid tumour and lymphomas as a solid tumour. But both arise from cells that are involved with the immune system of the body. Leukemias predominantly arise from the cells that make your white blood cells, and leukemias can be divided up into two main types, depending on which type of white blood cell they arise from. So there are the myeloid uh, white blood cells and the lymphoid uh, blood cells. And again, with each myeloid and lymphoid type of leukemia, you can divide them up into acute and chronic. With the acute leukemias, as the name implies, it tends to come on quite aggressively and usually patients need to be admitted to hospital straight away to start intensive treatment. With chronic leukemias, you, there might be a period of where you just monitor them and only institute treatment when they need to have treatment or their treatment is delivered mainly on an outpatient basis. With the lymphomas, the lymphomas predominantly arise in the lymph glands or in lymphoid tissues. And again, you can divide them up into two broad types. There are the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, and there are about 60 different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. But broadly, again, there are the uh, more high-grade types and the low-grade types. The high-grade uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas usually need treatment more immediately. Whereas the low grades, again, there is a period where you can monitor them. So there are similarities with the chronic leukemias. With Hodgkin's lymphoma, it is a disease predominantly of younger people. And again, though it is not as aggressive as some high grade lymphomas, it usually means that patients need to be commenced on chemotherapy, which is usually outpatient chemotherapy. In terms of the similarities between the uh, conditions, they both arise, as I said before, from cells that are involved with the immune system. The differences are that with uh, leukemias, you're generally making a diagnosis based on blood or bone marrow. With lymphomas, you usually need a lymph node biopsy and a scan called a CT scan or a PET scan. 
the drugs that we use to treat the leukemias and the lymphomas, there can be some overlap, but generally the treatment schedules for the diseases are different. Okay, thank you. So again, throughout the next, the, the rest of the webinar today, we'll be kind of looking at um, those different groupings of lymphomas, leukemias, acute and chronic as, as kind of uh, uh, to, to take us through that pathway, because there are nuances around that about how different diagnoses are, are, are um, treated in that, in that way. So, but thank you for, for setting the scene around that. So moving on, so we know that uh, starting with diagnosis on the pathway, it, it, um, from, a, from a, a patient perspective, we know that uh, receiving a diagnosis, a, a cancer, cancer diagnosis can be, have, have a massive impact on, on people. And even though um, blood cancers and leukemias and lymphoma are actually the fifth most common cancer, um, many people who got a diagnosis haven't necessarily heard uh, about it beforehand. Perhaps um, we know that uh, leukemia in general and, and perhaps kind of leukemias in children are, are kind of generally more heard of in, um, uh, in the general public, but that still represents quite a small percentage actually of the overall leukemias and, and lymphoma obviously from that point of view as well. So we know that it can be quite difficult, particularly uh, either from a chronic uh, diagnosis or even acute diagnosis where suddenly your treatment and you're kind of put into the pathway uh, uh, quite quite rapidly without really any time to adjust or to take in any of that uh, that news so it can be quite frightening um, I think perhaps Barbara was will start off from your experience as a clinical nurse specialist what are the kind of biggest changes or challenges that you see at that kind of point of Di point of diagnosis? I think there is the shock of getting a cancer diagnosis and the worry that one will die and whatever reassurances you try to give in terms of outcome or even active monitoring and all of that, the worry remains that this has got life-changing impact on a person's life and of course it does. I think we sometimes have to remind people that in some ways they're the same person that they were before the diagnosis and that life will continue and that people will learn, take on a new role with new knowledge where they will learn about the diagnosis, the treatment, the side effects and how to live with all of these. But the beginning of a diagnosis, um, that appointment is always overwhelmingly full with information and details and questions that one often has to revisit because it is a huge change in a person's life and nobody can take it all on in one go. Oh, thank you. Um, so Doreen perhaps um, can expand a little bit on that from your own experience of what it was like at uh, some of the challenges or what, uh, and changes that happened at your diagnosis. Yes, I think for me, it came so out of the blue. Um, I feel very well and fit and healthy. So to suddenly find out that I had a, a stage four um, diagnosis of uh, CLL just knocked me for six. Um, I wasn't ill. I don't do ill. And for me, the biggest questions at that point weren't so much medical, but were, will I see my girls married? Will I hold grandchildren? Um, you know, will life change dramatically? Those were the things that were going around in my head initially. Um, asking about more um, in-depth stuff about the disease itself, that came a few weeks later, but at that mm. initial diagnosis, you feel your life stop. And Reem, what was from your experiences? Yes, um, well, I was diagnosed exactly one month after my 25th birthday um, and it was a complete shock. However, I did have symptoms about three to four months before I was diagnosed, but I went on with my life as normal, going to work, etc., ignoring the symptoms. And then eventually I went to my GP and immediately he knew there was something wrong based on the information I'd given him. Um, so, you know, I did have severe symptoms, one of which was um, severe night sweats, um, coughing. And um, so I did know there was something wrong, but never 
I would never have thought that the doctor a week later would then tell me, the consultant, Reem, you have cancer, you've got Hodgkin lymphoma. It was a complete shock. Um, I thought that that was it. My life was you know, going to be over. But luckily, because of the information I was given and the support from the consultant, the registrar doctors, the nurses, they enabled me to understand it. I had never heard, as you said, Stephen, I had never heard of lymphoma before the age of 25. I'd heard of leukemia, but not lymphoma, which was a shame in a way, because if I had been aware of the mm. symptoms, maybe I would have gone to my GP um, earlier, much earlier. And um, But then I did obviously my own reading, but then it took me, I guess, around a week to digest everything. But my treatment started very, very quickly. It started about 10, exactly 10 days. So I was diagnosed in the middle of September and my treatment started um, the 1st of October 2006. I remember the exact date. And um, it was, you know, it was very, very overwhelming, as Barbara mentioned earlier. Very, very overwhelming. But eventually, after a, a month or so, I, I managed to, um, you know, had certain tools, support from my family, um, my friends. As I said, the con I, I believe my consultant and the nurses were probably the best support I had received throughout the entire treatment because they were very patient with me because they knew I would, you know, I, I, I saw myself as a very immature 25 year old, very little life experience. So they really did helped me, they counselled me and they really helped me to understand, Reem, this is curable. You are going to be cured. It's a curable disease and um, just take one day at a time. Thank you. Some good good points there. Um, and just to kind of finish on this particular section. So from Prem, from your point of view as a consultant, as a clinician, we've heard around some of the challenges to kind of get uh, from a GP diagnosis into um, kind of seeing the consultant from that point of view but what 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 are the kind of things that you could add to this around providing that support at, at that moment of diagnosis as, you know as we've discussed this is a, a life-changing diagnosis for all uh, patients and as Reem and Barbara have said that patients are understandably overwhelmed and I mm. think in terms of what we can do as uh, clinicians, because this is an enormously frightening journey, is first of all, try and, you know, when we get that GP referral, try and expedite investigations as quickly as possible so that we get to a diagnosis. And then I think it's important that when you're giving the diagnosis, because we, we need to remember that in terms of leukemia and lymphoma, significant advances have been made. Many of these diseases are diseases are curable and if not curable in terms of survival has been extended substantially. So it is to emphasize that and also not to overwhelm patients, especially, you know, young patients like Reem. These days we've got TYA units that deal with younger patients and to give them bite-sized bits of information but always be truthful and I think always be positive and tell them, you know, I, I often um, quote uh, Winston Churchill, if you find yourself in hell, you keep going, but you will come out of it the other side. Thank you. And, and as I think all of you have highlighted, it's really a kind of a joined up approach between the consultants and the clinical nurse specialists in the hospital, um, yourself as a patient, friends and family where you can get support and the providing that information and support um, at any stage from that diagnosis onwards and we'll keep coming back to this but from lymphoma action and leukemia care's point of view we've got lots of information and support and different services to help with that as well and continue to kind of join all of that up together okay thank you so we're going to move on and i'll hand on to charlotte thanks Stephen. so um I think it, it segued quite nicely from, from the first section um, to talk about, we're now going to talk about active monitoring specifically. And I just took note of, of something Doreen said there uh, in terms of thinking about how a life would change beyond the medical setting. And I think the, the challenge with active monitoring is that, um, you know, the, the general feeling when, when 
among the general public about how a cancer journey should play out is diagnosis, treatment, cure or relapse and, and, and so on from that point. But the, the challenge with active monitoring is perhaps that people ask those questions that Doreen suggested asking and, and then uh, struggle with the, the strangeness of active monitoring in terms of how it how it compares with um, that that perception that I've described. So active monitoring is something that largely applies to chronic conditions um, where treatment is not immediately needed and a patient is simply monitored for ongoing symptoms. Um, and in a way, it's a positive thing in, in that it means that the treatment has, um, sorry, the disease hasn't progressed to a point where treatment is required and the patient is often fairly, fairly well. But that means it's difficult for someone to feel uh, supported sometimes. Um, at our own work at Leukemia Care shows that it's actually um, the group of patients who are on active monitoring are the those most likely to report mental health issues, needing emotional support and generally struggling with their diagnosis. So it's de definitely a, a, a difficult period um, for patients. So I wanted to, um, I was hoping to come to Doreen first on, on this point. Um, Doreen, I wondered whether you could comment on whether you know, all the things you said previously about how you were concerned about how your life would change dramatically with treatment. How how did you feel once you sort of went into that first period of, of having a chronic condition? Right, actually, it, for me, I found it quite nice going on to watch and wait because I'm the sort of person that likes to know a lot about my condition. I want to know the ins and outs of it. So watch and wait gave me the opportunity as uh, somebody else had said to me once, it's a time for watching and learning. And that's exactly what I did. There's so much really good information out there. I mean, obviously your consultant and the nurse specialist will tell you so much, but um, a lot of the organizations like Leukemia Care and Lymphoma Action and many others um, have some excellent um, publications and that's a really great place to start to get an understanding of the background and then you can go online and sort of look at all these uh, uh, research projects and various bits and pieces to get more of an in-depth so in terms of learning about the disease I thought active monitoring was a great time to get your head around it so that when I had my hospital appointments I perhaps understood um, a little bit more about the questions to ask and what was important and then when the doctor spoke to me I, I felt we had a bit of a partnership because I did understand a little bit of that but in terms of life for me one of the things that I found so hard was fatigue Fatigue really was a big thing. And I felt that during active monitoring, it's something that's often quite dismissed, I suppose, because there's not much that you can do about it, but it's about changing uh, the way you, you work, the way you do things in order to manage life. Because fatigue isn't just tiredness, it's this overwhelming feeling that I needed to lay down and shut my eyes. And when you're trying to work um, and, um, and, and live, um, fatigue can really be a battle. And so changing, I, I ended up working two days, having one day off, then working another day, and then having another day off in order to spread my hours across the week to help me cope. Um, so for me, fatigue was a big thing. And the other thing was my lumps and bumps. Um, I used to wear a scarf around my neck to cover those up. Um, but I had a really big um, lump under my arm and that, the little practical things, you know, wearing a bra was really quite uncomfortable. So it's about wearing clothes that cover things up and, and you can feel comfortable in uh, during the day. Um, yeah, I think that's great. Thank you, Doreen. Um, I think what you said about using active monitoring as a positive opportunity to, to learn is really great advice. Um, just on, on the fatigue and, and learning to deal with symptoms, obviously being on active monitoring doesn't necessarily mean you're entirely well, as you've described, you are still experiencing symptoms. So 
do you have any advice for people who are, who are struggling in that sort of limbo between well enough not to have treatment but not not quite well enough to do all their daily activities as you described yes i think it's about pacing yourself and one of the things i learned was if i did too much it really uh, my levels just really dipped and then the next day i would actually quite feel unwell so generally i would do things to a point that i just began to feel a little bit odd and then i would stop um, if I if there was something I really wanted to go to, like a barn dance or a wedding or something like that, I'd think, blow it. I know tomorrow I'm going to feel bad, but I'm going to enjoy this day. So um, so I would say to people, just learn your know your body, know how how much to push it, know when to stop. But equally, life is for living. There are times when you think, yeah, just go for it and enjoy yourself. It's a great positive um, spin on things. Um, Barbara, I wanted to come to you next. And we've had some specific questions about how uh, patients are struggling to deal with sort of the ongoing worry um, and knowing at what point they should ask for help in terms of monitoring their own symptoms and things. Do you have any advice for patients sort of wondering whether they should get in touch with their, their team whilst they're on active monitoring? Yes, I think Doreen has just said, you really need to know your own body and that's really important. If a patient complains of something repeatedly, I've got to believe it, I can't say it's in your mind. And it's important for patients to have as much information about their disease, about the B symptoms, the fatigue, the unintentional weight loss, drenching night sweats, perhaps unexplained fevers, Perhaps a loss of appetite and a feeling of being full all the time, perhaps due to a loud spleen. All these things, the more information they have to understand their body and what's happening, the more they'll be able to manage what's happening and understand it. So one of drenching night sweat or, or two because the central heating has gone on isn't going to worry me. And the patient needs to know that, that I'm talking about drenching night sweats that last perhaps for over a month. There are, of course, no hard or fast rules. So when somebody has a new little lymph node pop up, doesn't mean they have to rush into treatment from active monitoring. It's this assessment of how big is the lymph node? Does it impact on their life? What have the blood parameters been doing? How is the person coping? There are so many multifactorial issues of how a patient approaches the illness and not everybody is as good as Doreen about being positive and learning and, and wanting to be part of that management, self-management. Many patients kind of think, you get a diagnosis of cancer, you're telling me you aren't treating me straight away, you're letting me die. There are all those kind of worries where a patient really needs to be held to understand that early treatment may not even be beneficial. So it's a, it's a very complex support process for patients at this stage. Thank you Barbara and Prem as a sort of final word on, on this uh, section. Um, Barbara mentioned there that early treatment isn't always beneficial. I wondered if you could just say something about sort of the clinical basis for active monitoring and why treatment isn't initiated always immediately. So it's, um, in terms of acting monitoring, we generally apply it to certain types of lymphoma, which are low-grade lymphomas, and certain types of leukemia, usually chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And the reason why we apply active monitoring is because there is no evidence that treating early improves your survival. So generally what would happen is a patient will be diagnosed and then initially they would be asked to come back to clinic generally at three monthly intervals and then four monthly and then maybe six monthly and we would tell them as Barbara said to look out for certain symptoms so that's unexplained lymphadenopathy or unexplained fever, sweats, weight loss or you know a human being knows their own body better than anybody else so if they feel that something is untoward report to us and then based on their blood counts and their symptoms, we make a judgment as to when they might need treatment. So that might be based on your blood count, so you become anemic or you've got a low platelet count as having CLL, or you start getting enlarging lymph nodes that are causing obstruction, or you start developing B symptoms. 
and we institute treatment at that stage because there is no evidence that treating asymptomatic patients in this group of patients confers any survival benefit. Thank you for that. Um, we have received a comment um, about our terminology of active monitoring. Um, we are, of course, referring to active monitoring um, here, but watch and wait is a term that other people may have heard, um, and they are essentially the same thing. So just in case anybody was wondering if I clarify that. Um, I think that's all the, the questions on this section, and I'll pass over to Stephen. Thank you. OK, so now the next, we've got a bit of time to really focus on um, starting treatment. So we've heard that experience of moving from diagnosis, active monitoring, where you've got a cancer diagnosis, but not necessarily starting treatment straight away, but at some point you may, or in the, the more the kind of um, high grade lymphomas or acute setting where you may have even been diagnosed in a, a accident and emergency, uh, not even coming through a kind of a GP route, noticing that something is wrong. And then often, um, treatment kind of happens quite quickly and 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 uh, and you're already starting on the roller coaster of, of of all of the challenges that that brings so we're going to spend a bit of time focusing on on that there are kind of the practical issues about um coming to on a regular basis to to the hospital we know that um travel parking the kind of uh, financial implications of that can be a can be a challenge as well as then you know, what it, what is what are the side effects what is the impact of that uh, uh, um, treatment going going to be um, so perhaps uh, I was going to start with uh, uh, Reem there actually um, in terms of from your experience how how did you kind of move from uh, onto what treatments that you were going to have and how did you um, deal with that yes um... Yes, thanks. So when my GP, um, he did a, just a quick urine test and, um, you know, he, he knew straight away there was something wrong based on the urine test and the symptoms I'd given him. So he sent me straight to A&E. He wrote a letter and I, I went that he was like, you need to go now. Um, so basically I, I went and I think they what they said to me, they didn't know, obviously, at the time that it was Hodgkin lymphoma. They thought I might have had tuberculosis as well because I was working abroad for a few months um, as a teacher um, so they thought I might have caught something when I was abroad because the but as far as I know tuberculosis and Hodgkin lymphoma they have similar symptoms so they kept me in the infectious diseases department for two days um, they said don't be in contact with anybody and um, and then after that when they did more tests such as a biopsy and they did many many tests within five five days I was then called in again, but they said this time you need to come in with a, with somebody, not by yourself, with a family member. Or so then I knew there was something wrong. So when I went in, that's when they told me that it was Hodgkin lymphoma based on the biopsies, etc. And then um, I started treatment, as I said, very quickly. Um, it's probably around ten days after I was diagnosed, and um, that was obviously very difficult for me. Um, one reason was because of my reaction to the chemo. Um, so um, is it okay if I talk about that, the, the symptoms that I had based mm -hmm. on after the chemo treatment? So um, when I had my first dose of chemo, um, I was they wanted me to stay one night in the hospital to monitor me. Um, three hours after I had the injections, which was ABVD chemotherapy, um, I had severe, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating here, it was severe vomiting. Um, that was the worst thing for me throughout the entire treatment was the, um, the vomiting, but um, that was the first dose. Eventually I got used to it. So I had one dose every two weeks for nine months and um, eventually my body in a way got used to the chemo and um, actually they said that's a good sign vomiting is actually a good sign it means your body's responding it's responding to the treatment and you know um, and then after that um, I you know they get you know obviously they provided support um, and gave me anti-sickness drugs and and things like that um, but obviously physically it was sometimes difficult leaving the hospital after the chemo mm. because of the fact that I felt very sick 
um, and I wanted to get home as soon as possible. Did you want me to elaborate, Stephen, on anything else? Thank you for that. I was going to actually kind of bring in Barbara. To, to, so, you know, as we know, some of the treatments can be very aggressive. And, and as you said, that's uh, your, your personal experience is uh, 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 a common um, anecdote in terms of uh, reaction to that. But uh, from Barbara's point of view, um, how, how else do you people cope or how do you help people to cope with having some of the chemotherapy treatments from a kind of physical point of view as well as the impact on uh, the mental health as, as well uh, kind of having to start on something like a quite an aggressive regime of treatment so i think initially it's important to assess the patient because different patients at different stages of their life may have different priorities so it's kind of important before treatment starts if there's any time to kind of find out what does the patient want to achieve what outcome do they want what are the obstacles to it and make a plan with them. Because for somebody who's in their 80s, it may be quite different from somebody who's in their 20s or 40s. Mm. And sometimes I think it's important to think, can the treatment be delayed until after the next, you know, upcoming birthday or wedding or christening or whatever in a that family's life or whatever's important to the person who's got the cancer? Or can the treatment be planned in such a way that perhaps attending a christening is possible because it'll be the good week before the next treatment starts. So all those things need to be considered for every patient individually. And it's important that patients tell us upfront whether they've had a holiday plan so that we can advise them what to do about it, if they're big life events. And then we do say to patients that we will provide supportive medication, for instance, for nausea with the regimen that we think may be helpful, but if it isn't, the patient must let us know because there's so many other things we can prescribe and help make these side effects more bearable. And of course, with every treatment, there is a toxicity assessment. Have patients develop pins and needles in their fingers or feet? Um, what is the nausea like? Are they constipated? Are their bowels moving? All these things. Because actually we want a person to get through the treatment as well as possible. Sometimes, especially with uncontrolled nausea and vomiting, it then puts people off further treatment and they get what's called anticipatory nausea and they can chuck up just by coming in for blood tests, never mind treatment. So mm -hmm. we're really trying to limit side effects and try and help a person get through it all. Yeah, thank you. Um, as Ben can uh, just bring in Prem in now, um, Reem kind of talked about a particular uh, type of treatment, um, gave the acronym there, the, etc. There are obviously different different types of treatment regimes. With, you've got different options available to you as a uh, as a consultant, depending on the type of lymphoma or the type of leukemia. So people will soon kind of get used to whatever their the acronyms for their particular treatment. Oh, but um, perhaps you could expand a little bit about uh, how you kind of uh, uh, apply those those kind of choosing the right treatments, or there's a, a defined uh, options to you already. And if I can add a second point to that, we've had a specific question about what are your thoughts, or how, how would you advise people about using complementary therapies or more holistic treatments along uh, for side effects or alongside. The clinical treatment that they might be having as well. Sure. So, in terms of uh, treatment options for patients with blood cancers, these days there are fairly tightly defined guidelines, and every single patient with a new diagnosis of cancer is discussed at a team MDT. So, for a lymphoma patient, for instance, we would discuss their pathology, their PET scan, their bone marrow biopsy, everything that they've had, and the responsible con uh, consultant. So say it is a patient with a new diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I would go to that MDT and I would say, you know, this is what I recommend. And then the other consultants, generally at IMDT, there are about 50 clinicians. So this is doctors and nurses at IMDT, and people would agree. And if they agree, that's fine. And it's been rubber stamped by the MDT. And sometimes it's a bit more difficult in terms of what is the best uh, treatment option. 
But for the vast majority of patients, I would say for 95% of patients, there are no guidelines as to the chemotherapy options that are available. Um, and everywhere within the United Kingdom, we follow those guidelines. Um, the second question about complementary therapy. So it really depends on what the complementary therapy is and whether we have any evidence that it may or may not interact with chemotherapy. So cannabis oil, for instance. So at our unit, we don't recommend its use because we don't know whether it interacts with the drugs that we're going to give them. So what we would say is we would advise them not to use it uh, until their treatment finished. Uh, but generally, you know, I'm all in favor of patients having whatever helps them to get them through this journey. But we just need to be mindful as to whether it interferes with their primary th their treatment. No, thank you. That's good. Good points. OK, let's uh, move on to the next section. Thanks, Stephen. So, um... The next point we uh, in, a, in a journey as such we're going to talk about today is the point at which treatment ends. Um, I think it's fair to say this does vary between acute and chronic conditions as to what the end point means for someone at the, at the point where active treatment stops. So it'd be good to hear a contrast between Doreen and Reem in a moment. But um, regardless of what treatment you've had or what condition you have, I think it varies by individuals as well as to how people feel once treatment ends. Uh, some people are relieved or want to celebrate, or others are um, perhaps worried about leaving the realm of the, you know, a lot of clinical care and all that support that comes with it, particularly if they're an inpatient. So there are, there are very different uh, reactions, which are all perfectly normal um, at this point. So. I wondered if we could come to Doreen first. I think you mentioned you had FCR um, for, for your treatment. How did you feel as a chronic patient after treatment, given that um, FCR may or may not work for a certain period of time? How does it? How did it feel to to have treatment and go back into that active monitoring phase? Well, first of all, I'd like to say I should have had six courses of FCR, but due to very low, um, uh, I have neutropenia, um, between myself and the consultant, we decided to call it a day at four rounds. So that was a decision that um, you know, he had in mind and he discussed it with me. Did I want to push on and do another round or maybe another one? or do we call it a stop at that point? And so between us, we decided that we were gonna call it a day at um, four rounds. We did know that there were some more tools in the toolkit it, when it comes back, because there's things like ibrutinib and other drugs, um, drugs there. So it wasn't that, well, if I stop now, that's it. I, unfortunately, as yet, I don't need anything else. So that was, so the end came quicker than I had anticipated. And then it was about picking up life again, because I was waiting for my bloods to come up so that I felt confident to go out to a coffee shop again or to, to mix with children. So those are things as you emerge from coming out of treatment, it's about getting confidence again to, to pick up normal life. Um, and then once that happens, it's, well, can I get travel insurance? Because now I actually want to make up for all the things that I haven't done before. So coming out of treatment, you know, there's that initial stop. There's that gradually feeling better when the nausea subsides, your energy increases, you feel more comfortable, you feel more like your old self. And then suddenly realize just for how long you hadn't felt well for, because now for me, I felt really fantastic. Um, I felt 10, 20 years younger than, than I was. And then it's about picking up your life again. And again, with the help of the hospital team saying, yes, you know, at, at this blood level, you have got some um, sense of uh, immunity. So it is safe to now start going out and doing things. And it's having that confidence to gradually emerge to a normal life. Thank you, Doreen. And Reem, would you echo those thoughts in terms of it being a gradual process post-treatment in, in building up confidence is important? 
Yes, definitely. Um, when I finished my treatment, um, you know, I, I lacked in confidence greatly. You know, I'd lost all my hair. Um, I put on weight because of the steroid drugs. I believe it was something to do with one of the drugs they'd given me. I put on a lot of weight. Um, so I looked different, basically. I didn't look like Reem. And, um, you know, I, I had to get my life back on track. You know, my work was put on hold. You know, so I said to the there were many things I wanted to do. So I kind of had this feeling like, oh, my, I've got my life back again. My tumor, I had a massive tumor between somewhere between my heart and lungs. And, um, you know, all was positive. And, um, you know, the chances of it ever coming back was very low. So I was like, that's it. I want to get married. I want to have children. I want to travel. I, I, I just felt like this feeling inside me, like I, I was free again. And um, I had a boyfriend at the time. We got married nine months later. Um, I'm not saying that's the best thing to do always, but I mean, I, looking back now, um, you know, I'm going to be totally honest here. I think that because chemo affects you, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally, you have to be very, very careful after treatment. So not to rush. You know, I'm, I'd like to advise young people, especially not to rush. Take your time. Take one day at a time still because you've just gone through something very, very difficult, very, very challenging. You've survived it, you know, and, you know, you need to just, as I said, take one day at a time and think about your decisions. Don't feel that, well, because you had nine months on hold, well, for my, my life was nine months kind of on hold. It doesn't mean now, you know, you, you have to just go ahead and then do whatever you, you feel is, you know, sort of rush into anything. Um, but this is my own, as I said, my own personal um, experience. Looking back 14 years ago, um, I might have done things slightly differently, um, you know, but that's good that's advice. Life. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Prem, I was going to come to you next. Um, just thinking of someone who's perhaps listening today who's approaching the end of treatment. Um, We've talked a little bit about how there may be some lingering um, physical, medical issues going on. What sort of things should people be careful of at this point? And what advice would you give to someone who was sort of leaving your care in terms of treatment? Obviously, they'd still be monitored, but in terms of leaving uh, their active treatment at that point, what should they be concerned about, perhaps? I think going through treatment is challenging. For most patients but once they're going through treatment they're very carefully monitored so there is a comfort blanket around them when they're going through treatment then treatment ends and suddenly you're out there in, in the uh, big wide world and asked to just get on with your life but i think sometimes the end of treatment in many ways is more challenging mentally for most human beings than going through treatment for me, I generally advise patients that in terms of getting a normality back in your life is going to take in the order of six to 12 months, depending on the intensity of treatment that you've had. This is not something that's going to happen quickly. So you've got firstly the physical side effects of chemotherapy and particularly just now with COVID, you know, the increased risk of COVID and us telling patients to continue to shield even after finishing treatment. So you've got the physical aspects of fatigue, uh, you know, the, the chemo brain, uh, the increased risk of infection. And then you've got the mental anxiety at the end of treatment in terms of the possibility of relapse. And I think with a lot of this, what helps the most is the passage of time. You know, the, the doctors and nurses are there, but what gives a human being reassurance is, you know, once you get to one year, once you get to two years. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Thank you. And Barbara, just to come to you as the last point on this one. Um, Prem's talked about a six to 12 month lag after treatment where people can expect to sort of rec return to normality. What sort of support should they expect to receive from their clinical team, their nurse specialist, that sort of thing during that lag time where they're just getting back to normal? Very tricky because most patients do feel that the safety net that we provided during treatment is kind of whipped out from under their feet. All of a sudden they get your incomplete remission. We'll see you in three months time when that can be 
quite stressful for, for a person who was used to having a lot of contact. Of course, we as clinical nurse specialists remain there for them, but generally with less intensity. We do point people towards support groups, organizations such as lymphoma action or leukemia care, all these kind of things for extra support out there because one day hopefully we won't be talking about their cancer but about their life in general and I think this role change from being in inverted commas normal to having cancer in treatment and then all of a sudden you have to go back to you're now living as a cancer survivor and you have to reintegrate into work and you have to take on your old roles in terms of I don't know being a mother, a colleague, uh, whatever it may be, can be very, very tough on people, especially as one of you said earlier on, you know, you come to end of treatment, some might want to celebrate, but many of my patients will say, why do I feel worse now than I did at the beginning? And it's the cumulative effect of the treatment that takes a long time, mentally and physically, to kind of get to a, a baseline that one used to be at. And it's a very, very tough time finishing treatment. There are the worries of recurrence, the late effects. You know, some people are stuck with peripheral neuropathy or effects on the heart or lungs. It can be difficult going forward when one kind of felt one was in this artificial state of having cancer and treatment with all the support and appointments, scheduled, unscheduled, everything that came with it. Thank you for that. So I think that segues nicely into yeah. the next section about relapse and recurrence. So, Stephen. So, a number of people have, have already mentioned about you know, one of the biggest challenges at the end of treatment is that, OK, um, it's, has, it, has it worked now? Will, how long will it continue to be uh, um, uh, uh, clear of, of disease at that moment in time. And obviously for the majority and for different types of lymphomas, that's, um, uh, that, that's the intent of that treatment at that time to have one, one round of treatment and, and uh, to be able to move on from there. But that's not always the case, depending on different types of lymphomas or how the individual has responded to that particular treatment. So relapsing or re the, the, even after a period of time, they're kind of recurring uh, uh, of uh, cancer disease again is, uh, can, can, can obviously be a challenge. Um, so perhaps I wanted to talk with, with uh, Prem first around when people um, are faced with having treatment that hasn't worked or that they have then relapsed for and they might need then another uh, um, treatment option. How do you kind of um, have that conversation, support people when it when they uh, are seeing you in, in clinic around those different kind of choices at that stage? Sure. Thanks, Steve. So for the vast majority of uh, patients, when you first see them and when they're going through that journey, you would discuss possible management options with them. So they would be aware if it was CLL or a low-grade follicular lymphoma, there might be a period of monitoring. And then if the disease were to progress, these were the treatment options. And then after that, what you might do. So that would be outlined. And similarly with Hodgkin's lymphoma or high grade lymphoma, you would discuss, you know, the chances of cure are X. But if you're unfortunate enough to fall into this category, then these are our treatment options at that stage. Patients will be monitored and then if they were unfortunate enough to relapse, you would look at, first of all, the duration of remission. And again, there are fairly defined guidelines as to when patients relapse as to how they're treated. And the patient would then again be taken to the MDT and they would discuss the options. For most patients with high-grade lymphoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma, for instance, if they were unfortunate enough to relapse, for the vast majority, we would think about a stem cell transplant. So there is a defined pathway. Similarly, like with Doreen, as Doreen has explained, you know, it was FCR and when the disease progresses or relapses, then there's Ibrutinib, there's Venetoclax, and this would have been, she would have had these discussions with her consultant. 
the greater challenge is for patients who have got more refractory disease. So they've not responded as you would have wanted them to. And then they may not be on this standard pathway. And you might need to look outside the box. And by looking outside the box, it's really in terms of trials. You know, what trials might be available for that patient. And again, the trial options doesn't necessarily have to be at the hospital you're being treated at. Yeah, they could be referred to other centres uh, for the trial option. Thank you. And I think it's, you know, again, from a leukaemia perspective and a lymphoma perspective, it's fair to say that there is a lot of uh, um, research and innovation and a lot of new treatments that are coming down the, the, the path, as it were, that may not be available now, but uh, are either in clinical trials um, or in a process of being um, kind of presenting on the evidence around that and uh, being considered to be available as part of the, the NHS um, guidance, guidelines and pathways that you've uh, described there. So um, there are there are continuing to be options uh, for, for both leukaemia oh. and lymphoma. Oh, absolutely, Stephen. You know, in terms of the progress that has been made in the last decade has been phenomenal. And what mm. we now have is this new treatment called CAR-T, yeah? yeah, which again is... Uh, more experimental, but available on the NHS. And, you know, the NHS was one of the first countries to go off the bat in terms of funding it. So all, all of this is coming on track fairly quickly, in my opinion. Yeah, no, you're right. Thank you. Um, and then Barbara, just to expand a bit more on that, we've had a specific some questions about kind of long term side effects. We touched on it a little bit about the end of treatment, but that's also, uh, I guess, part of the challenge around whether those long-term side effects are something that can be um, almost expected or managed, or does it mean that actually the, uh, um, that the, the, the lymphoma or the leukemia is coming back, is recurring again, or that you have relapsed? Or, and how do you kind of, um, I suppose, provide that kind of support, um, uh, that kind of reassurance at that time, or what, what next steps to do for, for people at that stage? So at the end, at the end of each treatment cycle, I try and offer each patient an end of treatment summary, where amongst the other we talk about um, long term side effects, what they may expect, because not everybody has the same ones, yeah. and how to stay well. And I think this is the particular point for people who may not have a curable um, lymphoma or who may have CLL and who may need retreatment in future, it's very important to say to patients that it's never too late to con take control of their lives, to look after their weight, their blood pressure, keeping their cardiovascular fitness, um, making sure that their diabetes is well controlled, because if people do need treatment in future, if they are in good health, it will help them cope with more toxic drugs in future or other treatment options. And I think sometimes people think, well, I've had cancer and that's kind of the beginning of the end, but it's not. You know, most of our patients live for many more decades and may end up having an unrelated other cancer later in life. Because I think, again, having cancer once doesn't mean that we can't get another cancer. I do have a few patients who are onto their fourth cancer in their lifetime, and yet they've always coped with treatment, have come out of it, continue to live, ended up with something else. And I think we can't take away the worry about relapse or recurrence, but we can try and help people live well while they're off treatments and to look after themselves physically and emotionally for whatever the future holds ahead of us. No, thank you. That's a, a good point to kind of end there on the, on that. We touched on um, referring up to lymphoma action and leukemia care in terms of some of the information, support, education and training that we provide. So that's in everything from webinars and videos that we have on our on each of our websites. We have regular magazines and booklets that we uh, uh, produce it, that cover a number of different either particular types of lymphoma or leukemia. Um, we obviously have our 
websites as well, which has uh, either signposting to other information or the information that we're covering ourselves. Um, basically, lots of different ways of kind of co uh, tapping into that information that is available. And really the kind of driver for that, and I think there is evidence out there around this that reinforces that, but the more informed uh, a person is, whether that's the patient themselves or their friends, family, carers, and uh, uh, around that, the more um, generally the better their outcomes will be, the more that they're going into knowing around uh, what what uh, their, their um, treatment might be or, or what the potential um, practical advice is, etc. Um, so some of those support services uh, as well, again, both uh, through our helplines or through different ways of contacting us and being uh, uh, in, in um, touch with either people on the end of the telephone or sharing those experiences with other people as well through, at the moment, um, much more online support meetings, virtual support groups, uh, more digital groups through Facebook, et cetera, but other ways of, of, uh, of doing that. Um, Charlotte, is there anything else to kind of add from a leukemia perspective around this, this area? I don't think leukemia specific, but I think you've already mentioned a lot of virtual stuff and I just wanted to make it clear that both of us are still very much open and up and running during COVID and we're providing anything that couldn't be provided in person, we will do our best to provide in a virtual format. So please do get in touch if you need any support. Both from Leukemia Care and Lymphoma Action, really thank you very much for uh, to Prem, to Barbara, Doreen and Reem for joining us today. So I'm going to finish the webinar then and thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.